Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, I was introduced as publisher and writer, which I always like to kind of emphasize because I like to talk about books a lot. And I'm going to talk about books and sort of storytelling and uh, Borges and a number of other things. Uh, but I want to start with um, the penguin. It's a good way of introducing. Did everyone see the Festo talk yesterday? See the robot arms and you know the big silver penguin. The big silver penguin is one of those things that sort of started this for me, or started a line of recent thinking, um, because he crops up in a William Gibson novel. Um, and this very strange thing happens when you're reading the novel, um, because the novel starts in this quite boring way, uh, which is not what you expect from William Gibson. You kind of read it expecting the future and the excitement. Um, but the novel starts with him on the Hangar Lane gyratory system, which is a really boring roundabout outside London. And then he has a meeting in a Cafe Nero, which is a really boring chain coffee shop. And you're kind of like, this is not the future I had hoped for. And then suddenly this silver penguin flies overhead, and you're like, yes, thank you. That was what I was looking for. Um, and then this weird thing happens, which is then you discover online that the penguin exists, that it's not a kind of crazy science fiction construct. It's something that's already in the world. Um, and, uh, and what's weirder about it is that in a later scene in the novel, um, the penguin reappears, and it reappears inside a particular architectural structure that Gibson describes quite specifically. And it's this architectural structure. It's Festo's head offices, and you can see it in all the YouTube videos. And he's just kind of taken this chunk of online, real-world, YouTube-y thing and just kind of stuck it in his book and then walked his characters through it. Um, this kind of ready-made of the network that's kind of sitting there. And in the, on the same page, in fact, he refers to one of the characters as being in a post-geographical position, which I kind of like. Um, I'm not entirely sure what it means, except that it seems to apply a certain kind of broaching of, uh, or breaching, rather, of um, different kind of overlapping spheres of, um, of position, of being, of understanding, of context particularly these kind of overlapping contexts in which these things live. Um, and I'm going to talk about ideas about that. Um, but th there's an older quote from Gibson as well. In a very early interview, he talks about this idea of notional space. Um, it's part of a longer conversation where he's talking about where he first invented what he later came to call cyberspace. But this is what he calls it first. Um, and he's talking about when he first saw uh, a Walkman. He first got a Walkman. Um, and he first put it on and went walking around in the streets and discovered that he could kind of carry his context with him in this really exciting new way. He kind of lived in his own kind of little bubble. And then on the same walk, he sees kids playing arcade games, a little arcade, big old kind of cabinet ones. And he describes how they're kind of really intently playing. Um, and he says that, that they, they're seeming to inhabit this, this notional space that kind of exists behind the screen, but not just there, like a, a vastly wider space. And he says that's when he first realized that at some point we'd all be living in this, this notional space. And I prefer the term notional space to cyberspace um, because it, it implies more imagination, frankly, and that's a good thing. Um, but the other author who's kind of central to my thinking about this kind of stuff is uh, Borges. Um, so, Borges wrote a lot of short stories, which I urge you to read if you haven't. I'm going to mention several of them as kind of little hooks for this. And the first one is Tlon Ukbar Orbis Tertius, which is a very short story about two friends who find in the back of a dictionary the description of a strange country that they've never heard of. Um, and this, this seems to be a factual record that somewhere this country exists, and it describes its customs and the people who live there and the cities. And over a period of years, they start to see more references to Tlon, this strange country, in the world. Um, more and more encyclopedias cite it, or articles in newspapers refer to it, in, until Tlon becomes real. In fact, until the whole world becomes the world of Tlon that's been kind of conjured into being by not just the writers, but kind of everyone's interest in it. And that's what happened to Gibson's notional space, and it's what we're kind of all doing all the time when we talk about things that might be the future. Um, we're kind of telling um, future truths, which are currently lies, but like hopefully at some point we'll have kind of dragged them close enough that they will become real. And if we keep telling them, 
um, then, 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 then they will become present truths. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the strange kind of circularities that we're currently seeing digital and physical cultures kind of co-producing. And this is my kind of favorite example of them. This is um, uh, Gurgaon, which is a big kind of new city outside India. It's where a lot of, uh, outside Delhi, rather, where it's where a lot of uh, tech companies are based in kind of uh, these tiny little offices. I went to visit some here who make e-books, uh, as many other things. I'm a publisher, as I said. Um, I'm interested in what's happening to books as they become digital. This is one of the places where that happens. Um, publishers box up all their old paper books, and they send them off to these guys in India who chop the spines off them and run them through scanners and transform them into something weightless, something else, this e-booky thing that we're not quite sure what it is yet. Um, and, and, and then they're sort of returned to us in this grand circle, but it happens very quickly now. But we're recapitulating something that's happened throughout history. The House of Wisdom was the scribe's house in Baghdad from the 10th to the 12th centuries, where all of the Greek knowledge that was lost at the beginning of the, all well, the classical knowledge that was lost at the beginning of the Middle Ages circulated all the way through uh, the Arab world and was kind of transformed by it and came out very differently. And um, we have, most of what we have of Greek classical knowledge now has kind of passed through Arab hands at some point and only came back to us hundreds of years later, um, sort of at, at the end of the, at the Dark Ages, or throughout the Middle Ages and onto the Renaissance. Like, it required this kind of huge circularity of knowledge and this constant transformation of forms from kind of papyri through to translation to the first written books um, and papers and stuff that then slowly made their way back. This is happening again, but faster. And I like to make things to kind of illustrate this point. This was a project from um, last year. Um, and I was fascinated by this idea that if these books are going out there and then they're coming back, like, how do we know they're the same? Like, in what way are they same? Or or possibly in which ways might they be different. Um, so I took Charles Dickens's Hard Times, which is a great novel because it's about kind of industrialization and the social changes that are produced by it and the, and the difficulties and the dangers of that. Um, and I did a bunch of really stupid things with it, um, which is that I made 50 copies of it. And each one of these copies differs in some slight way in the way that possibly some of these guys who are transcribing all of our literature and sending it back may, might, if they wanted to, slightly change it. Um, so some of them radi uh, are radically different. Some of them are uh, translated into other languages with Google Translate, so it's probably unintelligible. But there's kind of like, there's a Russian edition in there, there's a Polish edition in there, there's a Dutch edition in there, I think, just machine translations. And then there's also um, uh, little changes. There's, there's there's little things that just tweak the world slightly, like the color of a house or the name of a street um, that, that will only exist in the mind of the only person who reads that book, right? You've just, you've hollowed out this tiny little space in literature in which you can tweak and change something. And that's kind of what happens to all of our stories as they, as they get cycled in and out of these different cultures and th in and out of these different formats. Um, what I really like about this is this went on show in a gallery in Holland, um, and, uh, and several of them got stolen, right? So, they, so they're now kind of like reinserted back into the culture again. Like someone probably will end up buying that at a secondhand bookstore and reading it and thinking that that is the story. And that changes all the time. But I did this kind of thinking like something like this must happen. And of course, something like this does happen. It happens all the time. Uh, my friend Andrea, uh, who does a whole art practice around ideas of piracy and kind of cultural transformation, brought these two books back from Peru, um, which are um, two different pirate editions of the same Spanish novel. They have a different final chapter entirely. We can't quite figure out how this happened, um, whether it was uh, an early draft copy that the, um, the kind of pirate translator um, kind of just added to, added their own ending on, or if there was some kind of misunderstanding, if it was entirely deliberate and they just wanted to mess with people. But in, in cultures where you find a lot of piracy, uh, in, in South America in particular, because they have a kind of a long route back through, through Spain for all their translations, it takes a while, uh, or India and China, you're going to get all these hybrid editions kind of cropping up. But those are, those, this isn't like a copyright fight. This is what happens to stories as they get retold and retold, right? And so Borges is again, right? 
So Borges is, this is probably my favorite Borges story, actually. Uh, it's called Pierre Menard, the author of the Quixote. Um, and it's, again, a very short story about a man whose entire life's work is to rewrite uh, Don Quixote, uh, the Spanish classic. Uh, but he doesn't just want to rewrite it, or he wants to do both more and less than that. He wants to write it again, but he only manages a little bit, but the little bit he does is exactly the same as the original. Right? And, but what Borges says about this, he says, um, you know, it's, it's, it would be very easy you know, for me to write a new version of the Quixote. It would be very easy for me to take that story and kind of change it, or it would be very easy just to kind of um, to write, to write an entirely new story. But for a man who lives 300 years after Cervantes to be able to write exactly the same story, that is the most extraordinary act of the imagination, because you're living in totally different circumstances. But what it's really about, what it, the real deal with, with this story is, it's about this re-engagement with culture. It's this idea that every time we retell the same stories, we are also acting on them, that we are changing them in some fundamental way because we're retelling them in a new time, right? That's every kind of, every engagement with culture is, a, is also a retelling and a reworking of that culture. So all these old stories that get pulled into the new are also important. Does everyone know this book, Fifty Shades of Grey? It's doing very, very well at the moment. I'm fairly sure it has, it's on its way to German translation very soon, um, if it hasn't been already. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's gone massive, basically. It started as a self-published book. Um, it then sold hundreds of thousands of copies. It got picked up by publishers. It's now sold millions of copies. It's become the biggest book-to-film deal ever being bought out by Universal Studios, all of this kind of stuff. But what's interesting to me about it um, is not just its content, but its provenance. Um, this started out as fan fiction. Um, it started out as a Twilight book, so the Stephanie Meyer Twilight books. So the author originally wrote Twilight fan fiction about Bella and Edward, the, uh, the main characters in, in Twilight, and then wanted to publish it. So she just changed the names and kind of pushed it out there, and it's become this kind of vast bestseller. And what she's done is just kind of reached into someone else's fictional world, kind of extracted some of the bits she likes, built a whole other edifice on the top of it, and then kind of carried on pushing that out. Um, and it's, it's dirty because it's, um, because it's erotic fiction. Um, and it's, it's not Twilight Light at all, actually. That's just wrong. Um, it's a whole other thing built around it that, again, engages with it and changes it. And it, well, Twilight Light may be because it's getting a lot of... Um, uh, there's a lot of sort of anger about it from professional writers and publishers because um, they, they don't like that it's fan fiction. Uh, they think that that's somehow kind of a lower form of writing. Uh, but they're idiots uh, because Borges wrote fan fiction as well. As we all know, Borges is the greatest writer. Um, Borges wrote uh, 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 Cthulhu fan fiction. Love, who's read H.P. Lovecraft? You must have Lovecraft fans in the room. Um, Borges wrote Lovecraft fan fiction. Uh, and he, even he was sort of criticized for doing this, but he was like, there's this fictional world that we, shall, we must engage with. But, but, he, um, but he actually kind of regretted doing it. He thought he'd kind of lost something. But he said, uh, the, the story is called There Are More Things, by the way. It's really good. Um, but he didn't really like it. And he, but so he blamed Lovecraft for being a poor parodist of Poe. So he said, like, it's not my fault I wrote this kind of crappy fan fiction because the stuff I was writing was already fan fiction of something else. Like, he sort of pulled that thing, extracted back. All of these stories are layered one on top of the other. The reason Gibson doesn't necessarily satisfy all his things anymore, why Gibson isn't cyberpunk, this is not what William Gibson or those kind of science fiction writes about, is because Gibson was always a beat writer, right? Gibson was a huge fan of Kerouac and Ginsberg and those guys. That was the tradition that, that Gibson comes out of. He doesn't come out of a... Um, of a kind of, of the science fiction writing culture. He was just writing about things that he genuinely saw in the world and wanted to write about. Um, but as soon as you put cyberpunk into the world, um, it sort of becomes a thing, and you get all these kind of weird offshoots like steampunk. Um, uh, it's the Charlie Stross quote about steampunk, which I love, which is when goths discover brown. Um, but there is more to steampunk than that. It is this kind of incredibly playful attitude to the stories that we're given, right? That you, you're just allowed to go, well, I like kind of a bit of this historical period and a bit of that historical period, and I'll just kind of ram them together and see what happens. And to be honest, we don't get enough of it. Um, 
there's not nearly enough. This is a, this image is um, on all the boards in London where they're building the new tube, si tube stations. This is London transport version of the future, apparently. This is what we'll all be going to be living in, which is brilliant. You know, we should have tube punk. We should have punks of all these different literatures kind of combining into one another. The internet constantly throws up all these weird new ways of writing stories. This is another favorite of mine. This is collaborative story writing on Omegle. Omegle is like a kind of um, uh, collaborative chat, uh, surprise chat thing. It's like chat roulette without the video. You just log in, and you get connected to a random stranger, and you just start chatting. So there's kids who log in there and start writing fan fiction in, in collaboration. This is, a, this is like two of them meet. One of them goes Voldemort. And they just both immediately launch into Harry Potter's fan fiction. They just start telling this story to one another um, because that's what they do with their kind of cultural stories. That's where these things sit. They're, kind of, they're not just the stories, they're this kind of mode of exchange. Um, uh, and, and all these different fandoms on the internet are all doing this all the time. Um, there's a more interesting type of fan fiction out there, which is the one that I really, really like, which is slash fiction. Um, do not Google if you're nervous. Um, uh, slash fiction is where you will take the uh, take a couple of characters from your fa fa bleh, your favorite fandom and uh, make them do things to one another um, that the authors presumably didn't intend. So that slash stands for character slash character. So you get there's tons of this in Harry Potter. So you get Harry slash Snape where Harry and Snape are more than just friends. Um, it extends back, it's got a kind of really deep pre-internet cultural history, particularly in science fiction fandoms. The, the first kind of officially acknowledged fan, uh, uh, slash fiction is uh, Star Trek stuff, uh, Spock uh, slash Kirk, uh, where all those loving glances between the commanders uh, are translated into something more. What these things are about is like a deep engagement with this culture, a really deep love of these stories that this is this is our story, it's our culture that we've grown up with, and, and we want a more active role in this, right? Like, we want to be able to take these roles. There's a whole other discourse in the fact that a lot of these stories are written about queer relationships, and a lot of them are written by women, which opens up like a whole new area of kind of interest in, in why you want to take control of these stories, which I'm just going to skirt around slightly, except to say that like, you can write slash of anything, and, and, and there's a huge amount of it out there. And I'll come back to that in just a second after I tell you about this project. Um, this is a project that's running at the moment, a project of mine in London. Um, this is a, a ship that's on top of the South Bank Centre, which is a big art centre by the river in, in central London. Um, and it's a collaborative project between a bunch of artists and architects to create this kind of space in which people can stay for a night, and there's also kind of artists in residence, and a whole programme of really wonderful events. Um, but I was asked to do something a bit internet-y for it. Um, and so what I did was I put a weather station behind it, um, which takes the weather at this particular location and puts it on the internet where I can use it. Because one of the things that bothered me about this ship, as lovely as it is, and it's a very beautiful thing when you see it sort of from the river or from central London, um, it fails in the first, first thing of being a ship, right? Which is that it doesn't move. Um, so I wanted to make it move. So I took that weather data um, and I applied it to an imaginary airship piloted by a mad, lost artificial intelligence. Um, and it's been going for about four months now. Uh, yeah, almost five months. Um, this is its path for about the last six weeks of that. This is it drifting. Um, it got sort of becalmed around the Aral Sea for a while. It drifted down south. It sort of crisscrossed the Iranian border. It's currently out in the Gulf of Oman. Um, this isn't pure, um, it's not just doing that. What it's doing there is it's trying to understand. It's, it wants to write a story. I was looking at all these kind of weird stories that were kind of coming out of the internet, and I was looking at a lot of them that were kind of getting transformed or twisted by kind of the spammy, odd nature of the internet, that kind of odd kind of writing that Russell was talking about that doesn't quite make sense. I want to see if it was possible to write a story in that voice, or rather, was it possible for this kind of robot machine to write a story in that voice? So, um, so, I, so what's happening here is, as it goes along, it knows its location at all times, and it's constantly trying to find things around it. It's looking for geolocated Wikipedia articles, it's looking for Twitter check-ins, it's looking for Foursquare check-ins. Um, 
Um, it's looking for kind of any information that's tied to that place, and it's drawing it all in, and then it's, it's trying to kind of speak it back. It's trying to running a bunch of kind of language recognition stuff on it to try and tell a story of its own journey, this kind of voice of the network, this sense of place. Um, it was also hooked into one other source for a while, uh, which was Grindr, which is, the, um, which is an online personal thing uh, for gay men, and it was really filthy for a while, and that was the thing that seemed to give it a kind of a really personal voice. Suddenly something came through that wasn't just this recitation of facts, but you, you got to add in this kind of extra layer of language to this thing. So for, for a brief period, it wasn't just kind of fan fiction for the world, but it kind of brought in this idea of slash fiction for the world. Um, as I said, there's, there's lots and lots of this kind of stuff. Uh, this is from the Transformers slash fiction community, um, which I, again, I just urge you not to Google so strongly. Um, but this idea that you can kind of take any of these things and put them together, um, these different voices and these different characters, are how we should be approaching, I think, a kind of huge, uh, hugely more of what we do. Um, this is the central idea for me of this, is that, that, that fan fiction isn't really enough. I look around the world and I see a lot of fan fiction. I particularly see it in tech. I see that most of the things that we make are kind of fan fictions for other things rather than slash fiction. Like, almost every startup is basically kind of an Apple fan fiction or a Google fan fiction or a face Facebook fan fiction. Um, can, we move, can we do some slash fiction startups, please? Can we take some of these ideas and actually pull them out in, in, in new and interesting ways and take some ownership of them? Because I think we have enough social sharing things. Um, I want to speak about one last idea before I'm done. Um, which is uh, this concept of code space. Um, code space comes from um, guys called Rob Kitchen and Martin Douglas, who are architectural and software theorists. That's where this comes from. It's a really lovely idea, and it's a really powerful one. So the canonical example of a code space is an airport, right? This is airport check-in. And what you have in this space is um, you have a space that's co-produced by by the architecture and by the software running it. And if one of those things fails, everything breaks down, right? If the software stops working, this goes from being this kind of amazing booking, tr uh, channeling, registration system into a big kind of angry, uh, big warehouse full of really angry, pissed off people. Like, it, it fails is what it's supposed to do because the software fails. So this entire space is kind of co-produced by these kind of things. Um, and, and there's many, many examples. Almost anywhere that you now engage with automated technology, most modern supermarkets are code spaces. If the inventory management stuff fails and the tills fail, like you can't buy stuff. Like the space itself is kind of broken. Um, but for me, like that, that it's, it doesn't go far enough because all the stuff I see in the way we're telling stories now and bringing little different bits of out of them and combining them, like everything here is a code space. Like, literature itself is a code space now. If you're reading stuff on the Kindle, but even if you're not, uh, the route to which you came to those stories, uh, the ways in which they're discussed and shared, the fact that we're all here today telling stories about different things are entirely co-produced with code. And yet, even then, I'm, I, I'm not sure we've gone kind of far enough with that idea, because for me, the technology isn't the thing at the center of it, right? Like, we're the thing at the center of it, and it's kind of us who have become coded. The, the technology is just all this stuff that we're kind of putting out there that's full of our own intentions and actions, however much it may produce uh, unintended consequences. So th there's kind of something else beyond code space that I don't think we've got to, which addresses how radically different we are. Uh, the fact that all these things that we're building and slapping old metaphors on, like e-books, are not like books. Um, the internet is not like a space. These, 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 these things that we've used to describe everything we've built up to now, they're starting to break down. And we're only going to be able to kind of figure out exactly what they are by, by coming up with kind of new, new ideas about them. Uh, Shelley Turkle says that the history of the internet is the history of metaphors about the internet. Um, well, we just, we need more of them and we need to pull them from new places. Um, there's something here 
at the nexus of all of this, which is about trying to build a one-to-one -one map of everything. So you've got this kind of pirate fiction, fan fiction, slash fiction. Uh, you've got weird la literatures cropping up in other languages. I could go on about uh, kind of pedagogic novels in India and, and China. But, but what all these things are doing, they seem to be trying to build like a kind of one-to-one -one map of the world, right? They're trying to approach um, uh, a, a complete coverage of all of these different worlds in which we exist, the online and the offline, the physical and the digital, which are not separate worlds, uh, and they don't have edges between them, but they're not the same worlds either. They kind of overlap in this strange way, in the way that you see happening in Street View, which is an attempt to build a one-to-one -one map of the world, which we all thought was kind of a joke. You can't have a one-to-one -one map of the world, it'd be huge, but you can in the networks and databases, and that's what Street View is attempting to do and what we're trying to do in these literatures. I'm going to very quickly tell the very last ba uh, Borges story, and then I'm done, which is the Library of Babel. Um, the Library of Babel is the infinite library. Uh, it's a series of connected chambers. Um, in each chamber is covered on the, all the walls with books, and all those books are all the letters that can be in every possible order. And in some of these cells sits the librarian, and it is the librarian's job to spend their entire life searching for the book in which all of the words line up in the right order, and you get the one kind of coherent story. And it's very unclear whether that book exists because the library is infinite, or that library is infinite because that book cannot exist. But Borges's story, uh, Borges's point, one of them, is that these stories are extant in the world. They're kind of out there waiting for us to go out and dig them up and apply them to, to new things. Um, I think the internet is writing fan fiction about us, and we're writing fan fiction about it. Um, maybe we'll get around to writing si uh, slash fiction about it. Maybe we don't. Um, but we do need to keep retelling these stories, uh, and we need new ones. So please write them. Thank you. I'm done.